أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأفضل الصلاة والتسليم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الردس وطهرهم تطهيرا واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran and what he states is the truth in the chapter of Al-Baqarah chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 Alif Lam Mim Thalika Al-Kitabu La Rayba Fih Hudan Lil Muttaqeen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in these two blessed verses he says Alif Lam Mim that book in which there is no doubt a guidance or a guide to the pious صدق الله العلي العظيم آمنا بالله Brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Now after finishing the discourse that we went through in the past few episodes it now becomes important for us to answer an important question and of course after proving that Allah exists proving that Allah is unlimited proving, proving therefore that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all perfect and all purposeful and all wise, then I must have a purpose. There must be a wisdom behind my existence. The question is, what is my purpose? Now, while that is an important question, the question that then begs to be asked or answered, I should say, is, well, for Allah to tell me my purpose, He would have to communicate with me somehow. The question is, how is He going to communicate with me? Now, today, inshallah, what we'll do, is we'll try to figure out what it is or how it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicates with me. And for those who claim that they have messages that are truly divine, then we need to take a look at them and figure out whether truly they are the message of Allah or not. And then finally, we'll take a look at certain characteristics um, that this message must have in order for us to determine whether truly this is the message of God or not. And then once we determine which message is the message of Allah, then and only then should we follow that message. So to get started, I, I like to start with a, a simple intellectual discourse. So the idea of communicating with one another is an idea that is not foreign to us at all. Actually, we know that if our parents were to punish us without telling us what the rules of the house are, we would consider that to be cruel and undue punishment, right? Therefore, um, we would know that in order for our parents to hold us responsible for something, they would have to explain to us what the ground rules are, first and foremost. Otherwise, it would be cruel of them to do so, right? To punish us. The same thing with our school. If we don't know what the rules of our school are, in terms of the rules of conduct, then it would be very cruel of them to punish us. The same thing with the system of law in any country or any land. Actually, it would be even cruel for me to have expectations of my friends to show up in a certain location where I expect them to meet up with me, but I don't message them and let them know that we want to meet up and have a gathering at a specific location at a specific time. Actually, it would be even Crueler if I tell them where to meet up with me, but I don't tell them what time to meet up with me, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave me the ability to rationalize, intellectualize and understand the importance of communication, whether it's through email or Facebook or messaging or through phone calls or through letters, he by priority would know that he would have to communicate with me. Otherwise, he can't really hold me responsible for any mistakes that I made because I wouldn't know what a mistake is and what isn't. So based on that then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have to provide me with a, with a message. So the question is now, now that I know that He would have to provide me with a message, because He is the all-perfect, all-knowing, He would know that He would need to communicate with me. The question is, how do I know which message is His? How do I know who is imposing a false message on me and who isn't? The answer to that is actually quite simple. All we have to do is go back to that first episode where we proved that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists and then we proved that He's unlimited. And we said because He's unlimited, then He is all-purposeful, He is all-knowing, He is all-wise, and He is flawless, right? We also proved that He is consistent. How so? 
because we said that because he's unlimited, he's unchanging. He neither has a beginning nor an end. He always existed, will always exist, which means that he's consistent. So now I have two important characteristics. One is that the message has to be a consistent one, that it's unchanging. And two, that it has to be non-contradictory, has to be flawless. Doesn't have any contradictions, any errors in it whatsoever. Also, this message would have to contain information in it that only the creator of the universe would know and no one else would know, meaning when it comes to the creation of the universe and certain um, information, scientific or otherwise, that no one else would be able to know unless they um, were the creator of the universe itself. Also, the message itself would have to have information in it that corrects past false claims. False claims by scholars of maybe other religions or by thinkers of previous times. And finally, it has to pose a challenge to the people of its time. It has to be miraculous in some way, supernatural. It has to defy the natural system. We won't be able to cover all of the points today, but we'll attempt to cover some of them. Now, if we look at the Holy Quran, and here intellectually speaking, we're just rationalizing, we're not looking at the details of the words of the Holy Quran yet, but rather we're looking at these main attributes of Allah, meaning that He is all perfect and therefore He is consistent, He is unlimited, doesn't have a beginning or an end. This consistency is important. Why? Because His message has to be consistent and unchanging. So if I compare the books that are considered to be divine, uh, meaning the books of the people of, of uh, the book, for example, such as uh, those who follow the biblical texts or the Judaic texts, such as the, um, the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? So if I look at the Bible today, the New Testament is the Bible as we know it today, and the Old Testament is the Torah. So if I look into the Bible or the Torah, and I look into the Holy Quran, what do I find? I find, for example, that the original text of the Bible doesn't exist today. I also find that the original text of the Torah doesn't exist today either. However, I know that the original text of the Holy Quran does exist. So now I look at the original text, I compare it from when it was revealed 1400 years ago, 800 years ago, 400 years ago, 300 years ago. Today, I find that the Arabic text is exactly the same and is unchanged. So right off the bat, that tells me that that's a check mark there for the Holy Quran that claims to be the message of God, the Word of God. While the other books I can't tell at all because the original text doesn't exist at all. Now you might tell me, but there are versions, yes, those versions are versions of translations. There are many versions of the, of the Bible. There are quite a few versions of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Bible and the Torah. However, they're not all consistent So um, with each other. And so um, the only way to know is to look at the original text and the original text doesn't exist. Now. That's point number one. The second point is the issue of contradiction. That the message of God must be perfect, must not have any contradictions in it whatsoever. Now if we look into the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, meaning the Torah or the modern Bible, we find, for example, that in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, God Almighty, according to the Bible, states that Noah was the most righteous of his generation. Now, in chapter 9 of Genesis, verses 20 to 25, verse 20 starts off by saying that when the Ark of Noah actually landed, that the first thing that Noah would do is become a husbandman and plant a vineyard. Hmm, that's interesting. Plant a vineyard. Okay. I mean, he leaves all things, and after being a husbandman, he, be, he plants a vineyard. Well, let's read on. So, by verse 25, we're shocked because we find that the son of uh, Noah actually found his father in his tent naked and drunk. Now you might say, well, who's to say that drinking is uh, forbidden in the Bible or in the Torah? Well, actually, the, the Bible itself in Proverbs uh, chapter 23, verses 20 to 21, actually states, and do not be among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. And then right after that, it actually says, uh, for the um, uh, uh, drunkard and the um, glutton shall come to poverty. 
So this proves to us that the Bible actually forbids and prohibits from drinking wine, especially the most righteous of his generation, Noah. How could he drink wine, uh, be a, a wine bibber, and become drunk? That's a total contradiction. We find also that in another verse, in Judges 13, chapter 13, verse 4, that the Bible states, and do not drink wine, nor strong drink. So again, in the Bible, it forbids from drinking wine. Let's take it one step further. In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 30, 32, it actually states, it says, in uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 32, it actually states that uh, wine, describing wine, it says, it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. So how is it that the most righteous of his generation could partake in something that God forbids? So you find that this is a contradiction. Now why and how could this happen? Now this happens because we know though the Bible, the Torah, they consist of elements in them that are obviously commands from God. There are other elements in them that are obviously additions or changes. Now the problem is in these additions or changes because if part of the, of the book has additions or changes, this is problematic which means that it is not the true message of God in its entirety. Now if you go talk to, to priests today and ask them who is it that actually authored the Bible, they'll tell you we don't know. Most of the Bible was authored by unknown authors and academicians those who are biblical um, scholars also will tell you the same thing. So this is also problematic, which means that they don't even know who the authors are, but they know that they were human. They know they weren't in the time of Jesus, um, uh, uh, and therefore uh, they, you know, they didn't receive the revelation directly from Jesus himself. This is most gospels, meaning most books of the Bible. This is problematic also. However, if we look at the Holy Quran, we find that in it there are no contradictions whatsoever. Not a single contradiction. So, again, we can say that the Quran gets another check mark, while the Bible and the Torah, um, unfortunately today, what we have in our hands is not in its entirety the message of God, that it does have additions to it and changes. Now, having said that, the next thing that we need to look at is the third point, and that's that the message itself should have elements in it, important information in it, that uncovers certain realities about the universe that no one else would know except for the creator of the universe himself. Now when we look into the Quran from 1400 years ago, what we find for example in the chapter of an naba chapter 78 verse uh, 6, we find that Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا الْأَرْضَ مِهَادًا And we made the earth a swaddle, or we made it swaddled. Now, Galileo in the 16th century was persecuted for claiming that the earth is spherical, that it's three-dimensional. However, 1400 years ago, we find that the Holy Quran, during a time where there were no tools of measure, like in Galileo's time or like in our times, where we could prove that the earth is actually spherical, we find that 1400 years ago, the Quran not only stated that the earth is three-dimensional, but mentions that it has a swaddle. Today, in modern times, not too far ago, only in, in recent times, was it discovered that the earth actually has a magnetosphere around it. And I believe that was around in the 50s that this information was, was uh, uncovered. And that's only because today we have technology that has allowed us to uncover this reality. So this magnetosphere is like a swaddle, just as a swaddle protects a baby from the elements and the atmosphere and the cold and so forth, the magnetosphere actually protects the earth from sunbursts, from asteroids and the like. Now there are other truths about the universe within the Holy Quran that we will mention next episode as we're out of time. So make sure that you tune into the next episode so that you can find out about other realities that are in the Holy Quran. I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brightens our path with the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt. And the last of our dua is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And until next episode, 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته